All right, just a reminder to please silence your cell phones. Um, and then we're moving from special meeting into our regular meeting now. So, Mr. Hatfield, can you take roll, please? Yes, sir. Uh, President Rausch? Here. Vice President McFarland? Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Member Blazy? Here. Member Ringgold? Here. Member Horowitz? Uh, Treasurer Lauterbach is not here this evening. All right, thanks. Moving into item two is a consent agenda, um, 2.1 approval of minutes from January 16th, 2024, organizational and regular meeting, January 16th, 2024, closed session, January 29th, 2024, special meeting, and January 29th, 2024, closed session. Item 2.2, the below staff have announced their resignations effective on the dates uh, the people and the dates listed in your agenda packet. Item 2.3, approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of December 2023 as listed in the check registers. Prepared by Ms. Holderby in the total amount of $10,739,787 is recommended. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation. And then finally, item number two, 2.4 approval is requested to authorize legal payments to the below list uh, for professional legal fees as um, to Thruin Law Firm PC for the total of $1,862.50 uh, dated January 25th, 2024. Accept a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Move to approve consent agenda. Items 2.1 through 2.4. Support. Motion by Ringgold, support by Hatfield. Any discussion? Yeah, I've got some questions on 2.2 uh, staff resignation. Uh, are we concerned about the number of paras that are leaving at this moment? Uh, Jeff can chime so, in here in a minute. Like a but we're always concerned <laughs> about paraprofessionals. Yeah. We have uh, posting on loop um, and we're doing our best of course to to work with those people to create the best conditions we can for them to stay folks leave for a variety of reasons uh, and I will say one thing that we might uh, consider doing a bit better is engaging with them uh, in an exit interview to, to better understand okay. why they leave uh, I don't believe any of these on this list are leaving under uh, poor circumstances, okay. other opportunities okay. and things of that nature. Jeff, would you add anything from a human resource perspective? Uh, only that it's, it is really the reason that we've started the um, process of doing these job fairs okay. the last two years. Uh, really it was to target paraprofessionals and we've had some success, but as Penny indicated, there's an ongoing posting yeah. for paras okay. all over. Cool. It just seems like a lot showed up this month so yep. thank you and we have a job here coming up at Dow High soon right Jeff yes yeah yep yeah. yeah. it's in April thank you the retainer yeah the retainer yes I followed up with the business office and um, it is a fee we pay uh, we don't draw down from that. Any other discussion on 2.1 through 2.4? All in favor of approval of the consent agenda, 2.1 through 2.4, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, best part of the evening, shining stars. Penny. When I did that, sorry. <laughs> I, it is pretty exciting. We have we have two this evening, and first I'll invite Julie Buddha to join me. Yay! We can we can clap multiple times tonight. Come stand right next to me. Yes, I'm going to read some things about you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's always exciting when we can recognize bus drivers. 
Uh, Julie joined our team in MPS in 1996 when she was hired as a substitute bus driver for the transportation department before transferring to a full-time position, which she has now and still holds in the district. 28 years of service, thank you, in our transportation department. Julie was nominated for her shining star by an MPS colleague. Among the comments are the following. Uh, Julie is a main bus driver for the students at Plymouth Elementary. This is really special, actually. She is kind and patient, has specific strategies in place that students, uh, for the students that need more support, such as assigned seats and plans, and you have a real kindness to you when interacting with students. You know your students at Plymouth very well. You understand their behavior. You know how hard to push them and when to give them a little <laughs> bit of a break uh, with those specific yes. students. You know all of your students by name and work really hard each year to learn their names, especially the new students yes. and those incoming kindergartners. We especially appreciate Julie on uh, bad weather days. Not that we have many of those. Uh, <laughs> when we're reminded how patient you are and how kind you are uh, with students and families. You often call to notify the bus garage when you're running a little bit behind, which they very much appreciate and allows us to stay in good communication with schools and with families. And overall are just such an asset to our team. Congratulations on being a shining star. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. <laughs> we have another shining star tonight. You can't take the mic away from me, though. <laughs> I know, I'm like, do I get to say something? <laughs> I think everybody knows Katie Stearns, but if you don't, we are so excited to uh, have Katie be our shining star tonight. She joined the MPS team in 1997 as a teacher in a shared position at Central Middle School and Midland High School, then became a full-time teacher at Midland High, the position she currently holds today. Katie earned her Master of Arts degree in secondary education from Saginaw Valley State University. In, addi in addition to teaching, she has coached girls soccer and POM, which we know you love, um, and has completed all of her experiences at Midland High. She was a student teacher there, and she was actually a student there. That is some great chemic pride. So Katie was nominated uh, for her shining star by students and colleagues, and among the comments are the following. You uh, make it your mission every day to be sure that students are doing well not just academically, but also, also emotionally. It isn't just about the job for you. You go out of your way every day to show people that you care. As the reigning queen of Chemic Pride, <laughs> you embody the spirit and values that make Midland High an amazing place. You have infectious enthusiasm for teaching. You ignite passion for learning and students. You make every lesson an engaging journey of discovery. Uh, we know that. We were just in her class recently for a visit. It was it was engaging journey of discovery. Uh, her genuine care and concern for her students, for your students, extend far beyond the classroom. You create a nurturing environment where everyone feels valued and supported. You are a shining star. Thank you so much.
ja. It's amazing when you look at both Julie and Katie that Katie is paying it forward by leading our students that want to become teachers in the, in the future. And then I just noticed that Julie's son Justin works at Hemlock where I work and he was, I just put this together, he was one of the uh, leaders that donated the welding equipment to Midland High. So what, it, it's awesome seeing what what a community we have that gives back to the schools. So, great. Uh, item 3.2, Brian, how are you going to follow that up? <laughs> I was just going to say that timing wasn't so good. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> Data, right? Um, I'll just stop. Razzle dazzle time. Before, before Brian Fog takes machines, over. entrance music, something. Really, really. And, and Brian. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, with our, uh, our team approach here covering the curriculum spot this year, we know secretly Brian loves to talk about data, and he <laughs> offered uh, to, sh to give the presentation tonight. Certainly a team effort in gathering all of this, but Brian's going to be the star of the show, and uh, Jen and Melissa and Jeff uh, and I may have some points along the way to chime in, but Brian's going to lead us through. I actually volunteered to do this. this it, it's entirely true. Uh, back in my former life, I did deal with curriculum a little bit. So when Penny offered up a chance, um, it actually truly does give me a chance to re-engage with what's most important in Midland Public Schools. So I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about some data tonight. And Phil, I've heard your feedback. We're going to keep it to terms that are you know easily understood. And I kept it below 75 slides for you. So um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but to prime it just a little bit, Penny did share with you all our assessment profile in the Friday letter. And I'm just going to lift out a couple of things for you this evening and briefly highlight um, some of the major points um, of pride for us, but also some of the areas that we're laser focusing on to um, enhance some of the achievement statuses that we have in the Midland Public Schools. So um, here's where I want to start. Um, this is my 11th year in the Midland Public Schools, and I think this is important for us to remind ourselves this is a special place to be not only as a staff member but also as a parent I have two students in the district I have a senior and I have a junior they came here in third grade so I've been able to witness their journey through um, the Midland Public Schools almost all the way through and basically by every single measurable metric we are within the top percent in the state top 10 percent in the state that's a point of pride for us and I can throw slide after slide after slide showing how great it is to be a Midland Public Schools parent how great it is to be a Midland Public School staff member. Um, but really, truly, it is a special place to be. And I, I'm not going to go through each every single one of these. But again, we definitely have points of pride. That's something that was very evident in our superintendent candidate profile. And I do not want to leave this presentation with people having a, a feeling that um, we are not achieving where we should be. Because you all as a board should be very proud of your teaching staff, you should be proud of your administrative staff. They work very hard to put you in an elite spot. So you can see just off the bat, in ELA and in mathematics, you are in you know, the top 10 percentile in the state. Um, there are little factoids that we often overlook, um, but in terms of seals of biliteracy, number of full IB diplomas attained, these are elite statistics. You as a board should be extremely proud. But with that, um, Penny's going to roll her eyes at me already, three slides in, but I like to use football analogies when it comes to it, right? As a devout University of Michigan football fan, for the past three years, it was great to get to the college football playoffs, but boy, did I want to beat Alabama, and boy, did I want to get to that pillar. And we know um, that in Midland Public, when we measure ourselves, we don't like to just do it um, against state averages. We like to compare ourselves to the best in the state. And so we've done this for the board a couple of times where we have what is called, um, we call it the ECG or the Elite Comparison Group, sometimes called the Unique Comparison Group. The Birmingham's, Bloomfield Hills, East Grand Rapids, Forest Hills, Gross Point, you can see the other districts. And these are routinely the highest performing districts in the state of Michigan. And that's where we like to measure ourselves, and that's where we like to benchmark. And those are the districts that we are constantly trying to um, perform 
at those same elite state levels as well too. That's what keeps pushing us to move above and beyond where we are currently. So it's important for us to set the context. Context is not excuses. It's just setting ourselves demographically up against what the elite comparison group is. I won't get too deep into the numbers, but there's about a thousand dollar funding gap in between where the elite comparison group is and where Midland Public Schools are because of the hold harmless millage, which we've been talking a lot about, and Penny will plug that um, at the end of this presentation as well too. Um, those districts are able to have a higher per pupil foundation at about a thousand dollars per kid historically than where the Midland Public Schools is. Also in terms of economically disadvantaged students, there's about a 20% gap um, in the amount of students that are deemed to be economically disadvantaged between MPS. You could see our green dots at the top. It's been a pretty steady rise over the past 10 years where we're gaining about a percent or two every year. And we are now um, in that mid 30% range. Again, not excuses, but an acknowledgement of some of the barriers that we are constantly working to overcome. The same is true of the percentage of students that have unique learning needs in the Midland Public Schools. We are above the state average and about 5% um, on average over the elite comparison group as well too. Again, these are not excuses. This is just comparing us demographically. Um, we do have an increased amount of challenges when it comes to meeting all of our students' needs and it's something that we like to uh, point as an area of pride that our performance is where it's at, even with some unique challenges here in the Midland Public Schools. So with the demographic set, we're just gonna talk about proficiency real quick. Um, and I wanna give you just a quick snapshot. From the 2023 assessments, that was spring of last year, our scores in ELA increased or stayed the same um, year over year in all but two grades. In mathematics, our scores increased from the 2022 assessments in all but two grades. And in science and social studies, they increased um, in two of the three grades from 2022. Um, this is important for us to point out because we did suffer some challenges in COVID. Most districts in the state of Michigan did, and we have been laser focused through the use of our supplemental funds and strategic use of our general funds to be able to recover, get back some of the learning that was lost and accelerate students learning beyond um, what our normal rate of growth is. Rebounding from the pandemic, um, I don't think that the fact on the right side of the slide is something that has gained much focus in the state of Michigan, but in the state of Michigan, none of the scores um, across grade levels have gotten back to pre-lockdown levels. Again, that kind of tells you the effect that the pandemic did have on learning across the state. In Midland, we're almost halfway there. Um, so we are proud of the gains that we've made. Um, we're almost back to level set in half of our subjects. In eight of the 18 subject levels, we are back to our pre-lockdown levels or exceeding those. It's hard to see and it's at the bottom, but we've given presentations about this in the past. We've done targeted tutoring. We've done summer school. We have secondary math and ELA seminar courses. We are laser focused on literacy interventions and curriculum enhancements, and of course, social emotional supports and also student staff supports too, which we attribute to the rebounding effect that we have seen um, coming back from the pandemic. I've said this before um, many, many years ago, I have classified Mid Midland Public Schools as what we call a progressive growth district. And basically what that means is the longer that students stay with us, the higher probability that proficiency is going to be reached. And you can see that general trend in the chart as you're taking a look at it. You see the state scores on the left hand side and you see the Midland Public School scores on the right hand side. And of course you could see that we outpace the state in absolutely every single um, grade level throughout ELA and you can see that it pretty much does follow a progressive growth trend from third grade through the 11th grade. As students progress, the probability of proficiency within Midland Public Schools trends in a positive direction. This is a little busy, but I wanted to limit my slides fill for you and put as much as, much as I could on <laughs> certain ones. Um, and what this does is it overlays um, the scores with state, with Midland Public, and with the elite comparison group. So what you're seeing with the red line is your state proficiency score. What you see in the blue bar is the Midland Public School score. And what you see in the gray bar overimposed is the elite comparison group. And you can see that it largely mirrors the trend in the state as the state goes up and down. So does Midland Public and so does the elite comparison group as well, too. You can glean certain things from this 
and you will see certain specific areas of focus based on where we see our largest gaps. If you're looking at the data and you're picking out one piece from the slide, if you take a look at third grade, third grade is that largest gap between the ECGN from Midland Public, and you're gonna see us talk about that in a couple of slides down the line. In math, um, the classification of progressive growth hits a few little snags in that classification. You could see that right around the fifth and sixth grade level and at the 10th and 11th grade level as well too. Um, when you're starting out in the third grade level, you're progressing pretty well into fourth grade. And then we hit a really good stretch in seventh, eighth and ninth. And there's a couple of areas in there that we're gonna laser focus on um, to try and get that progressive trend back in mathematics. Same chart from ELA, now just with mathematics, and this is where it overlays the state percentage and also the elite comparison group. And you could see where some of those target areas that I had talked about um, starting to show themselves in our comparisons to the ECG as well too. You could see the gap really narrowing at eighth and 11th grade between the MPS performance and the elite comparison group, which again trends toward that the longer you're with us, the higher probability of proficiency and success within the Midland Public Schools. In science, um, you could see our overlay with the state of Michigan. It's pretty much a stable trend when you see we do have a bump in eighth grade, and 11th grade gets back into that 50th percentile. And when you're overlaying, there is much less of a gap in science than you saw in ELA and mathematics. This is a definite point of pride for the Midland Public Schools. You know that we pride ourselves in our STEM work. We've done a lot of extensive work on this, and you could see that we're almost nearly identical in grades 8 and 11 with the elite comparison group when you're stacking up proficiencies. In social studies, this is as um, progressive growth as you can get. You can see that the longer we're here, the more that we're trending toward proficiency. And you can see that when we overlay this, this almost mirrors identically with the elite comparison group, that it's progressive growth. And you can see that there is not that much of a gap between the middle of public schools and some of the schools that perform the best in the state. Um, a unique chart to take a look at is our SAT average composite comparison. This tracks it over time, overlays at the bottom the state score, at the top, you have the elite comparison group and you have the Midland Public Schools. You can see that the pandemic did have a pretty drastic effect on MPS, as I've said. We've done a lot of work to rebound and you could see that we are starting to trend back to normal. 2021 was a very unique year, something that we had to stare at that data a lot and say, what, why is it that the ECG didn't move that much and Midland Public Schools did? We have some theories on that that we're still testing out based on number of students that actually tested that year. The state actually does not want you to use comparison data for 2021 because there were a lot of schools that were not in session. Students did not have to test and that really is a very difficult year to be able to compare scores across the state and especially amongst peer groups as well too. You could see that when we started getting back to normal in 22 and 23 that that gap started to narrow itself once again. Growth is something that we pride ourselves here in Midland Public Schools. The state actually in their index scores that Penny shared with you in the data profile, it actually is weighed more than proficiency. Your growth weighs in at a 34% um, indicator and proficiency is right around 31%. So the state is valuing growth more than they are proficiency at this point in time. Um, we're proud to share with you in a quick snapshot that over three quarters of students in middle of public schools in both math and ELA experienced average or above average growth in both subjects. And compared to the elite comparison group, this is definitely something that you as a board should be very proud of your teaching staff and your administrative staff on. You could see the bar um, is Midland Public, that's in green. You can see the ECG um, overlaid above the state who's in gray. And you could see that Midland Public Schools is outperforming the elite comparison group when it comes to the percentage of students that are averaging um, above average and average growth in the area of English language arts. The same is true in mathematics as well too. Um, you can see that Midland Public Schools is right up there with the ECG and often outpaces where the ECG is and far outpaces where the state is as well too. You can see that the pandemic had quite a drastic effect on growth in mathematics, not only in Midland Public Schools, but across the state. And you can see that our trend in growth has rebounded much to the similar way that the elite comparison group and the state did as well too.
Uh, areas of focus for us in Midland Public Schools, I said that we're going to talk about some of those areas. Um, you saw that in third grade when we were talking about ELA proficiency, that was the largest gap that we had um, from the elite comparison group. Because we are progressive growth, what we firmly, firmly believe is that if we can get our foundational scores higher in third grade at our younger grades, that, that will provide us a better platform for vaulting into higher progressive growth outcomes in the end. You've heard presentations here about how we have doubled down and tripled down on foundational literacy with um, our interventions, having literacy coaches, all the work that Jen Service and her team has done with new curriculum, with our retired intervention tutors, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure Penny and Jane can enhance that much more than I'm saying. But we firmly believe that doubling down on early literacy will help pay dividends in the end in enhancing our progressive growth in the English language arts. Um, you can see that our average SGPs, our focus area, I've put my star right between four and five um, because I'm not going to bore you ridiculously in this presentation. I won't explain how student growth percentiles work. If you want to come have a cup of coffee with me, it'd be a great conversation. But really, our SGPs in fourth and fifth grade are based on the work that's done in K through three, and there's a lot of research that says that. So we firmly believe, again, on doubling and tripling down on our early invention and literacy to be able to move ourselves into that next tier of performance in English language arts. Um, in mathematics, I talked about a couple of focus areas, and our focus areas in math are to take a look at why in five and six we're seeing a touch of a regression. You can see that regression is also true at the state level as well. Um, so we're looking at curriculum alignment in five and six and also in 10 and 11. We really would like to see 10 and 11 mirror progressive growth and not regressive when you're looking at your movement in 10 and 11 um, back about eight to 10%. And so we have a focus in our high schools on professional learning communities. And those professional learning communities are doing a deep dive into our curriculum alignment and also working with students um, in our mathematics seminars that we've used with our supplemental funds to be able to assist with um, some of those areas that we deem need a touch of progress. So those are some of our focus areas in mathematics. You can see that our SGPs, when we're doing them by grade level, um, they're also reflective in those areas with that five, six that we talked about where we need to do a little bit of a curriculum focus there. Um, our SGPs mirror our concern in that area and where we're going to double down our interventions. Penny and I, a while back, did a presentation on what we have used our supplemental funds for. I don't want them all to just be attributed to ESSER funds. Um, our board did a phenomenal job in assisting us in lobbying to get full at-risk funding, our 31A funds. We went from around three quarters of a million dollars to $3 million to be able to invest in interventions. And again, you've heard presentations on how we have exponentially increased our participation in summer school. Very intense individual and small group tutoring, both after school with retired educators and with paraprofessionals. Our seminar courses are in their second year of existence at our high schools. They've been there for a while in our middle schools and we exponentially increase those as well too. We were about one FTE before, now we have four full-time dedicated teachers to those seminar courses. Learning coaches as well. We historically as a district had one. Um, at one point we were up to four learning coaches to assist our teachers. Elementary literacy coaches, you've heard that presentation. You heard me talk about how we are going to be reinvesting um, in that foundational literacy. We have strategies around making sure students feel like they belong. We know that if you feel like you belong, you can learn better. Um, we are doubling down on our assessment data, knowing what students need their interventions on and deploying our um, tutors and our teachers to be able to assist of course, with social emotional well-being in our school resource centers as well, too. Um, in recent publications, we released in our schools, and there were a couple of quotes that were in there, and I won't read them to you because I know that you all have, but basically what these quotes tell you is this. Midland Public Schools is a special place, and it is our duty as an educational staff to make sure that we are not taking our position lightly. It's easy to get complacent. Complacency usually equals regression. And our goal and our mission is to make sure that every single student is maximizing their academic growth potential. And because we are laser focusing in on those, we take it extremely seriously 
to invest the community's resources where we believe that they will target um, the students and the academic areas in the public schools that need them the most. Again, this is a very special place to be. When you're seeing rankings in your index scores that have improved for nearly every single school and um, niche rankings, while sometimes those can be algorithms, it's nice to see that those algorithms also point to that you have very special programs in place as well too. We have a great school district, um, but this is, I hope the message has come through that we are not gonna be complacent. Um, we want to continue to position the Midland Public Schools to compete with the best schools in the state of Michigan, and we will continue to level set and put ourselves within that unique comparison group, and hopefully one day we are putting ourselves above those ECGs in proficiency and growth in all subject areas as well, too. With that, Penny, I'm sure there's things that I missed that you would rather highlight, and Jen as well, too, if I missed a few things on literacy, please enhance. Anybody wants, I've got a list, but anybody else <laughs> first? I've got a question. Can you explain the, uh, I know you've done it before, but the difference between the foundational allowance uh, with the ECG and ours from a tax standpoint, from a per student funding standpoint? Certainly. That $1,000 gap goes all the way back to 1994. So in 1994, any school district that was above $6,500 in their foundation had the ability to impose a hold harmless levy. And that hold harmless levy was based on how much higher they were funded at that time. Many of the districts in the elite comparison group were funded at thousands of dollars beyond where the Midland Public Schools was at that time and chose to do a hold harmless levy that's higher than what Midland Public Schools has. And they've sustained that over time. And so they now have the ability to collect more dollars per student because their voters will reauthorize those than we currently do. You were set at where you were in 94, and because we've done that renewal, if you were higher in 94 and you've renewed all along, then you're higher than MPS is now. Yes, sir. Brian, I, I think you probably could have, with that presentation, had a smoke machine and laser light show. <laughs> that was pretty exciting. Um, what was the? I, should, I was going to pick walk-in music, but Penny wouldn't let <laughs> well, me. Well, that too. So. Next time. <laughs> Things to consider. Okay. In the future. To, to know that we are within striking distance of the ECG and at some levels yep. leading the way yes. um, where we're getting a thousand dollars less per student and we have a higher student population that is economically and academically challenged is simply phenomenal and you guys have done a wonderful job and our teachers have done a wonderful job guiding this district and, and leading these students um, it is absolutely that presentation was amazing and one of the best I've seen in a long time. Thank you. That, just a comment. No, yeah. no, no real questions. Could not have said any better. I, I did want to highlight just a couple specific things too. <coughs> Starting with question that way back at the beginning we had a chart that showed students with disabilities versus state average. How one thought I had was is that because we've become a district of choice for students with disabilities? Certainly. So we should celebrate that. Right? We do. Is that students in our area, school of choice into MPS because of the services we provide to students with learning disabilities. Certainly. Um, and then late, later on when we talk about growth and proficiency, is there any, and this is for future, is there any way to understand are we growing all students of different proficiency levels the same? Are we getting gro growth out of every academic uh, perspective? Or you know what I'm trying to ask. I do. Basically, are we growing the top, bottom, and middle students the same uh, along the spectrum? Yeah, that data is available. And Penny won't let me do it, but there's another presentation we could give um, on the difference between student growth percentiles and what's called adequate growth percentiles. And an adequate growth percentile is, are you on track based on your performance to eventually meet proficiency? Um, and that is actually where your school index ratings come from, not just your SGP, but your AGP. So those data sets are available and ones that we really like to analyze to see if we're hitting the mark amongst various grade levels 
and subgroups of students as well too. So um, there's a wealth of knowledge for us out there. It's just using the data to be able to drive instruction, which I believe our PLCs are really working hard to be able to do within their buildings and the building school improvement or MyKIP teams as well too. Um, and Phil, we did review some of that in yes. CIA just, just today. Yes. Oh, good. Today. So we went through that exact What's that, that view? achievement by grade and growth yeah. by category. Mm -hmm. Thanks for lifting that up, Brad. I wasn't sure I wanted to uh, chime in, but we did. Uh, we were at Chestnut Hill today with Chris Waha, the principal there, and Jen uh, and Melissa, and we took a look at our NWEA data specifically, and it does give teachers that view that you're asking about yeah. in a more real-time fashion so that they can take action in the classroom. Yeah, we, we talked today about um, the next steps we need to take to be better users of the data that we have to inform all the decisions we make at the classroom, school, and district level. Thanks, Brad. Mm -hmm. Just to comment on that too from CIA, our teachers and our administrative staff across the board is really working hard on data-driven um, strategies, and that is, that's why we're seeing these numbers um, and to know that we're doing it even more now than we have in the past um, especially since covid um, i think we're we're on target to really keep excelling and to your to your point it already looks like we're having we're, we're, you're setting us up for a conversation about budgets at the early elementary did, did you level. did you catch that phil for literacy <laughs> so i just want to call out that you know i appreciate <laughs> using the data-driven approach to target where we need specific inter interventions. So thank you. I, in particular, am really excited to see what we can do with literacy because I know you guys really are doubling down um, on consistency across the district and making sure that we are getting all the resources we need for every single individual learner. So I'm excited to see that third grade literacy number kind of creep, creep up because we know third grade is is the year it, that dictates, you know, kind of your future if you are reading at the level that you should be. Any Can other? On your list, Phil? No. <laughs> <laughs> I I uh, checked some of them off as my fellow board members asked questions too. So, um, any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it, it, if this presentation is a reflect is reflective of anything it's how dedicated our teachers and staff are to yeah. teaching our children and Scott said it extremely well so I won't belabor the point but thank you to our wonderful mm -hmm. staff that that really mentors our, our kids every day yeah thanks for noticing that and uh, we're really working to be intentional and really proud of our admin team that we've been working with um, to, to really dial in that intentionality through professional learning, our professional learning communities, our literacy leadership work. We're definitely headed in the right direction. So thanks for noticing that. So that presentation is available. Is that posted? It's not yet, but we certainly will. We'll send that out to all of you as we do, and we can post that uh, on the website. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is item 3.3 superintendent search process update earlier tonight at 6 o'clock uh, this board met in a special meeting to select our final candidates um, so tonight we selected three candidates that we will be interviewing the week uh, actually next week um, on February 26 starting at 5 30 p.m. After that, we will decide how many uh, candidates go to day in the district out of those three, uh, the week of March 11th. And then we have a board meeting again on March 20th to do final selection, uh, final interviews necessary and selection of the candidate uh, on March 20th. And potentially Wednesday, February 28th, if necessary. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Everything yeah. Monday yeah. evening. The 26th. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. 
and the article's already at the uh, Lincoln Dinner News. <laughs> You're efficient, Dan. <laughs> All right. Uh, at this time, we'll move into item number four, request to address the board. Uh, Mr. Joe Bonadies, first on the list. Uh, greetings. Since the public has no standing at these meetings, I would like to take my three minutes to review some of your policies regarding interactions with the public. Let, my, let me start by saying this is 2024 and we are in a relatively high technology communication world, which those in 2040 will giggle at, but here we are. Many of you work in offices and receive a large amount of incoming electronic communications. Looking at the Board of Education webpage, we find the following at the bottom. Quote, the Board of Education can be contacted via email at board at midlandps.org. You can also connect on Facebook, X, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. The mailing address for the school board is not obvious at the upper levels of the web page. However, on your agenda, you report letters to the board. Occasionally, we see email submissions in your data pack from people requesting FOIAs, but not always unless Mr. Bruton specifically calls for it to be included. Yes, we have those records. So it looks like no one sends, spends much time communicating with the board unless it's by the U.S. mail in an envelope or maybe hands it in. I'm sure all of you handle things at your day jobs with only paper showing up in an envelope. Maybe it is time to update the policy or the behavior to show your level of interaction with the community. And no, I don't want to see all the bills and invoices. That's irrelevant. Second, uh, as my wife Renita mentioned at the last meeting, the Open Meeting Act in MCL 15.267 requires a roll call vote that the purpose and that the purpose be stated in the open meeting in which the roll call was taken. In two of the past meetings, the board went into closed sessions without a roll call vote. The board president defended the, their process saying that there was a 7-0 and a 6-0 vote at these two meetings, so it met the two-thirds vote requirement. But that is not the whole requirement. It requires a roll call vote. That is not the same thing as a voice vote. These details do not seem to matter to this board. I guess the law is for us, but not for you to follow. We would still look to respectfully request the minutes of those two closed meetings since the board did not follow the law. And I personally was offended when the two ladies on the board smirked at each other while calling for and seconding the roll call vote for closed session at the last board meeting. There's your three minutes instead of five. Liberty once lost is lost forever. Thank you. Mr. Anita Bonadies. Good evening. MCL 15.234, Section 1, a public body may charge a fee for a public record search if it has established, makes publicly available, and follows procedures and guidelines to implement this section as described in Section 4. MPS still has posted procedures on its website, though it is refusing to follow those procedures. Until MPS has posted procedures that it will follow, they are not permitted to charge a fee for FOIA responses under Section 4, but must still fulfill the request. I put in a FOIA request on February 2nd. I noticed my FOIA did not appear in the agenda packet for today's meeting. It was for a copy of all FOIA requests, responses, and fees that MPS has received since October 16th of 2022, not to include mine. I was charged $160, which included an additional $2.53 for a thumb drive, which I did not request. So I guess the district continues to charge FOIA fees against FOIA law. I paid $766 for FOIA fees during the time I'm told you do not have a valid procedure and guidelines posted. I noticed that only certain FOIA requests were put in the agenda packets from those received Others were in the packets, but weren't given to me during this request. Like, I'm not sure why mine wasn't included this time, since it was submitted over two weeks ago. I found that most FOIAs were fulfilled for no fee. Reasons given? One, there is no charge to fulfill this request. Two, the district has determined that a waiver of the fees assessed for processing your FOIA request is in the public interest, 
even when the requester didn't request the waiver. And the final one, these documents are board record, therefore free of charge, because they were deemed in the public's interest. A lawyer submitted a FOIA that had 54 request items, and the response alone was 14 pages, sent by USPS and at no additional charge for postage. He received a variety of documents to the FOIA, plus additional information, and paid only $262. He also received a letter from Thrun, MPS's law firm, and I quote, please assure all future communication from you and your law firm are directed to me. Seems this lawyer can now skip the FOIA process and fees and go directly to using taxpayer money to pay for his interactions in the future. I've paid over $1,000 for FOIA fees over the past two years. 670 of that has been for agenda packets. These should be made publicly available at no additional cost. Many other public entities either post these online before a meeting or email them at no charge by request. Why does MPS charge so much or anything at all for these packets? Thank you. Uh, next on my list is Caitlin Liu. Okay. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm Christine. I'm Junior from Dow High, and I want to bring attention to the issue of climate justice and Oso Go Green, which many of you probably know is an organization at Dow High that tries to address climate justice and sustainability. Um, climate change is a human rights issue because everyone should have the right to live or the right to live with dignity. Global warming is causing losses of food, cultures, and even language, and it's affecting the most vulnerable communities, which often are the ones who have contributed least to the crisis. Um, rising temperatures, extreme weather, and polluted air and water have resulted in negative health impacts, ranging from malnutrition to disease outbreaks. And as a student, I hope to live in a community where we recognize and are actively addressing climate change. I want, want to feel inspired and proud to be part of this environment, and I would like to take tangible steps to mitigate its impact. And being in a school environment and seeing the countless papers that we use every day for you know, worksheets and seeing the leftover food we have in the cafeteria, I often wonder how many trees we are cutting to do a classroom assignment and how many families we can feed if we save more food. Um, implementing green initiatives can be transformative for students and it doesn't have to be complicated. Simply creating safe spaces where we can talk about climate justice um, implementing classroom initiatives so we can become future leaders of the world and encouraging us to be aware of our everyday actions and discussing the impacts that we have on our planet. One thing I love about Midland is the wildlife. From Dow Gardens to the Great Lakes, I don't want to lose our natural environment to climate change. I don't want the once clear and pure aqua waters to turn into dark, or murky, uh, a dark and murky ground. I don't want Dow Gardens, the place where I played tag with my best friend, and made some of my, of my most special memories to lose a battle against climate change. But through Go Green and other climate initiatives, I know that students have the capability to change our world, and I'm excited to see what we can do. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Uh, next on the list is Gigi Hong. And then, Okay, I, help me with the, I'm struggling to read the handwriting. Cindy Roberts? Yes, Cindy. Thank you. Sorry, I scribbled. That's okay. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Cindy Roberts. I retired from Dow High in 2020, and I have been a volunteer with the district ever since. I'm here to tell you about some very hardworking, passionate MPS students and staff members, what they're doing, in addition to excelling academically, of course, um, why they're doing it, and how you as board members can leverage your role to exponentially increase their impact. Every day across the district, there are students and teachers who are doing everything they can to address the climate crisis head on. These individuals understand that the climate crisis is real, it's intensifying and it's caused by human actions or in many cases, inactions. They also understand that the climate crisis is an issue of generational justice, human rights, 
and equity because it disproportionately impacts the physical and mental health of many groups of people, including our students and all future generations. Every day, students and staff are taking the initiative to do things like make sure items that can be recycled are actually getting recycled. And if their school only recycles paper and cardboard, students are loading plastic and aluminum cans into their teacher's cars so the teacher can transport the items to the recycling center. Environmental clubs at the high school, like Christine was talking about, are spending their money earned from can returns or grants to purchase plants and plant native pollinator gardens uh, to buy compost bins. They're also collaborating with schools and local universities to conduct waste audits so they can better understand how to reduce and manage waste materials. At Dow High, there's a sharing cart in the cafeteria where students can put unopened fruit that they're not going to eat. Last semester, over 500 pounds of fruit was saved from going to the landfill and, stood and was donated to the open door. These students and staff members fully understand that recycling and pollinator gardens are not going to get the world where it needs to be in terms of carbon neutrality. Nevertheless, they are proactively leading by example to help restore and maintain a healthy and equitable environment. So what actions can Midland Public Schools take right now to make a difference? As an educational entity, Midland Public Schools possesses the resources and the influence to be a leader in driving positive change. We have an absolutely amazing array of world-class resources right here in our backyard. Working together with our community partners it could make an enormous difference. It is imperative for our students and our community that Midland Public Schools makes a bold commitment to adopt sustainable climate resolutions, create a sustainable task force, uh, adopt re reasonable uh, environmental and economic policies and integrate environmental sustainability throughout the district's K-12 curriculum. The time for MPS to lead on the climate crisis is now. Thank you. Thank you. Well, do we have any anyone else to address the board this time? This is everyone on my list. Um, Christine and Cindy, just a uh, couple things on, on my head, um, off the top of my head. I think you embody the definition of think globally, act locally, and I appreciate everything that you all have done in your student group. It's, it's inspiring and want to see you do more. Um, one of the things that MPS has focused on in the last 10 years is the energy intensity of our buildings. And there's um, a really good thing for us to focus on as the Board of Education is the more that we can reduce our operational costs of our buildings, we can take that money that would have been spent with Consumers Energy or the gas company and spend that in the classroom instead. So as a Board of Education, we like to look at things from how do I plow more money back into student success? And through some of the initiatives that you're working on, you can help us to do that. So we'd love to see more action on that, on that part. To give you two specific examples of how, we do, how we've done this over the last 10 years, the current bond that we're working through right now, we've added tens of thousands of square feet of building space, and our energy bill has stayed the same. And then furthermore, we're also working through this um, energy performance bond right now um, that is paying for itself in capital improvements through the energy savings that we've, we've done. So um, I think the board's role in this is how do we continue to make our buildings more and more efficient so that we can take those costs and spend them in our classroom because we want to drive the student outcomes um, as our part of, of helping you achieve your larger initiative. Um, okay, with that, that closes our uh, request to address the board. Item five is curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, item 5.1, the CIA minutes from January 16th, 2024. 
who has that's me uh, curriculum instruction assessment CIA study committee minutes January 16th 2024 members present were myself Ann Horowitz, Jennifer Ringgold, Penny Miller Nelson, Brian Bruton, Jen Service, and Melissa Toner. Special guest was Joy Yang Chow. Uh, we met here at the administration building. <clears throat> we had a diversity, equity, and inclusion update. A summary of recent activities across the district was provided. Highlights include the partnership with United Way to sponsor a Martin Luther King Jr. Day of volunteering for Dow High and Midland High students in the elementary inclusion focused book and crayon project. We also talked about the facility study. Feedback was sought on the December presentation. The administration will continue connecting with other board study committees and draft a timeline for stakeholder feedback sessions. We adjourned at three o'clock. Uh, I Yes, and so the last meeting we brought this for the 28 day period of examination and we're back tonight for your action. Uh, the administration recommends approval of this book. It's gone through all of our standard review processes, including uh, lots of input from teachers, math teachers who will be using this. If approved, this purchase is contingent on available funding approved by the 24-25 budget. The text will be used for geometry, our standard and accelerated levels. The title is Geometry with Help Chat and Help View by Larson Boswell. It's the Big Ideas Learning Series, which I'm excited to say we now have a progressive series in our high school courses that builds some continuity for students. Uh, and that's the book for your action tonight. Thanks, Penny. Um, Entertain a motion for item 5.2. And move that we accept, uh, that we move forward with item 5.2 for adoption, textbook adoption, um, geometry with Cal Chat, Chat and Cal Smart. Motion by Hatfield, support by Horowitz. Any further discussion, questions? Typically, what grade are we talking about with geometry? Yeah, so geometry is typically our 10th graders, but you know we have a variety right. of pathways for students, so it, it could be 9th graders, <coughs> we have a few 8th graders taking geometry. It's, it's a mixed bag, but typically uh, the progression is algebra, geometry, algebra 2, so 10th grade. Okay, thank you. Is this the first time there's been a progressive series of books? Yeah, uh, so interestingly, we have um, used a process that allowed course the teachers of a course in isolation to pick it's been kind of a mixed bag in the 16 years or so that I've been here, and we worked really hard to get a, a series because students then have a familiarity with the approach of that text. Um, but I just also want to say, because you know I can't turn down a moment to say something about curriculum and instruction, um, you know, this is a resource. It's not our curriculum. It's not the end-all, be-all. It's a resource our teachers used uh, to teach the standards. All in favor of approving item 5.2, textbook adoption, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 6.1, or, or item 6 is finance facilities and operations. Item 6.1 for action, fiber replacement. <clears throat> Brian and Dave. Thank you. Um, bids were sought to replace the multi-mode fiber optic cable within our schools and also between the administration building and grounds transportation in the warehouse. The project replaces the multi-mode fiber, the bulk of which was installed between 98 and 01 with single mode fiber. This change will allow MPS to provide modern speeds within our buildings now and for the foreseeable future. Administration recommends awarding the project to the low bidder, Master Electric Inc. of Gladwin, Michigan for $167,710. And if we do have the approval of the board this evening, the funds will be out of Series 3 bond. Thank you. Is there a motion for item 6.1? I'll move to approve item 6.1, fiber replacement, and that the contract be awarded to Master Electric, Inc. of Gladwin, Michigan, as stated on the Support. agenda. Motion by McFarland, support by Ringle. Any questions or clear points of clarification? What the process, 
does this look like? I mean, is this going into walls and into the ground? That's my Dave. And like, <laughs> Glad Dave's here. <laughs> this sounds like a really so, big yeah, project. It is, it is involved. Um, so it, it, between, we have multiple only in a few places. We have it in the buildings going from the main point that the fiber comes in to all the different closets throughout the building and then between here and the buildings on this campus. Um, the reason for replacing it is because multimodal fiber runs with, not with a laser, but with an LED light, where regular fiber, single mode fiber runs with a laser, so you can get higher speeds out of the single mode fiber. We're gonna switch over to single mode fiber everywhere so that we can keep increasing our speed over the next 25 years, um, because right now that is our bottleneck in our network, but this is going to, it, it'll involve some nighttime work. So yes, it'll, it'll follow the same path in some places, um, here on this campus, it's gonna, we're gonna have to make some new paths and stuff, but we'll do that work off hours so we're not disturbing anything. So yeah. typically they run them in duplicity and then they do cutovers. Uh, okay. Well, you could have just said that. <laughs> 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 oh, that makes sense. You do it together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All in favor of approving Item 6.1, fiber replacement, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Item 6.2, for information, gifts. Brian. Thank you. Tonight we acknowledge the receipt of 31 gifts, totaling $12,710.98. They represent a wide range of items from college advisement supports to field trips to robotics and also some athletic equipment. Per tradition, all donors will be acknowledged in the broadcast credits of tonight's meeting and also through board correspondence. So on behalf of the administration, the board, staff, and students, we express our sincere gratitude for the continued supports of our stakeholders. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to our generous donors. Uh, item seven is human resources, 7.1 human resources study committee meet minutes from February 9th, 2024. I have those, Phil. Uh, the HR committee met February 9th, 2024 here in the admin building in conference room nine. Uh, we met from 3 p.m. till approximately 4.30 p.m. Uh, in attendance were myself, uh, Mr. Hatfield, Ms. Horowitz, uh, Karen Justin, Brian Bruton, Jeff Jaster, and Penny Miller Nelson. Uh, we had a number of agenda topics, the first being retirement review. As of the February 1 early retirement notification deadline, the district has received retirement notifications from 12 teachers, two paraprofessionals, and three administrators. The next, <coughs> excuse me, the next topic is staffing process and planning. The 24-25 staffing timeline and processes were discussed. Uh, next is the recruiting calendar. Uh, with fewer teacher retirements, the need to recruit is less than previous years. However, the district will continue to engage with university partners to maintain positive relationships. Uh, item four on our agenda, we discussed the MCEA grievance update. Uh, in there, an update was provided regarding the current grievance. Uh, number five is teacher attendance. Uh, we went over attendance data and discussed uh, the effects of, of various attendance issues. Uh, item six is facilities discussion. Feedback was sought on the December presentation. The administration will continue connecting with other board study committees and a draft and draft a timeline for stakeholder feedback sessions. And that was the conclusion of our committee minute committee minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, item seven point two for information. The below staff members have announced their retirement effective on the dates. Jeff. Thank you, Phil. As is typical this time of year, MPS has many names to read. Um, and again, this will be based on different staff groups along with the effective dates. For the teacher group, MCEA retirements effective May 31st. The following have submitted their uh, retirement notification. Pamela Andrews, Seabird Elementary. Carol Bremer, H.H. Dow. Mary Elizabeth Curtis, Adams Elementary. Sharon DeReese, Northeast Middle School. Curtis Gladhill, H.H. Dow, Kelly Gunter, Plymouth Elementary, Yvette Kalinowski, Northeast Middle School, Lynn Marino, Special Services, Eric Metner, Midland High School, Catherine Mativa, Woodcrest Elementary, Judith Pallette, Chestnut Hill Elementary, and then Ernest Seebeck, Adams Elementary. 
Uh, currently, MFP retirements are paraprofessional uh, group. This is Joanne Douglas at Jefferson Middle School, also effective May 31st. And then uh, uh, the final group is sort of a catch-all of administrators, managers, um, variety, some from transportation. And this group includes uh, Joanne Coates, Chestnut Hill Elementary. Her retirement is effective June 7th, 24. Dirk DeBoer, Northeast Middle School principal, his retirement is effective June 30th, 2024. Vicki Gines, H.H. Dow High School, effective July 1st. Jeffrey Lauer, PAS, uh, Administrator, effective June 30th, 2024. Paul Pendred from the Administration Building IT office, or Department, effective June 28th. Luann Skrzynski, Transportation, effective May 28th, 2024. And then Melissa Toner, Administration Center, Curriculum Office, effective June 30th, 2024. Could we deny it? <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, yep. and congratulations to everybody announcing their retirement. It's an exciting transition in life, and wish you all the best. Um, item number eight: correspondence to and from the and from the Board of Education for information, letters from the Board of Education to the following individuals or organizations as listed in the agenda packet. Item number nine are scheduled activities for information. Um, and the meetings are, meeting schedule is listed uh, in the agenda packet for the remainder of 2024. And then item number 10, uh, study session discussion. Are there any points of clarification or questions from any of the board members? Yes. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that when we're talking about the December presentation that we had, nothing is moving forward with that as of right now. We have work to do in the future. We will have focus groups. We will have lots of interaction with um, the public with with everybody involved with that but not to confuse what was in our um, communique today that and or listed on the district's web page and or the operating millage frequently asked questions that were in the communique that were listed today as well so MPS operating millage renewal now I'm gonna read it just because I think it's important the MPS Board of Education recently voted to place a millage renewal proposal on the May 7th, 2024 ballot. This renewal provides a significant source of revenue to the school district's operating budget, including salaries, utilities, and educational programming for students. You can find more de detailed information by visiting our operating millage webpage, linked here, as well as in the frequently asked questions document, linked in the button below. And that has all the additional information that you can go in there and see that that doesn't have anything to do with our December presentation. Those are two mutually exclusive things. Dan, we need another push out there of hitting, <laughs> hitting the emails that to inform the public of our MPS operating millage renewal on May 7th okay. is a renewal of something that we have renewed multiple times. It's not an increase, it's a renewal. Brian, how many times have we renewed? Since 1994, every 10 years. I'll just offer, since I was prepared to say that to you, even better coming from you. Um, there is a frequently asked questions document, as you said, on, on the website. They, we have linked the Our Schools document that went out in the Midland Daily News a couple weekends ago and there is plenty of information in there. The website also has a link to a survey that we would love our community to take regarding uh, the operating millage. That would be helpful information for us to get uh, community insights. And Brad, I'll just double down on what you said right now. Our communication as a district is focused exclusively on the May 7th, 2024 operating millage proposal. We will clarify as needed when people reach out to us. That is our intensity and focus to make sure folks have the appropriate information about that. And again, lots of opportunity ahead after May to talk about facilities. 
facilities and we welcome those opportunities. Any other board members have questions or comments? Penny? Yeah, just a couple. Uh, again, those retirements, some of those are, well, all of those are so well deserved. Some a little harder to see than others. Um, maybe some of those in the room. Uh, but we really wish those folks well. It's a lot of knowledge and expertise and care uh, represented in, in that entire list from administrators and bus drivers and paraprofessionals uh, and office staff and certainly our teachers. Uh, I also want to just acknowledge that last week was School Resource Officer Appreciation Day. And uh, if you follow us on social media, you saw that we celebrated them, communicate as well. Uh, so that was fun to just honor those four awesome members of our team. We're really thankful to have them in our schools. This week, uh, on the 22nd, Sarah, yes. is School Bus Driver Appreciation Day. So I should have mentioned that when we had one of those as a sh uh, shining star when Leslie was with us. We're, we really, really can't say enough good things about our bus drivers. They uh, are the first ones often to see our kids at the start of the day and really set the stage for a positive day and oftentimes the last one as they get off the bus. Really important members of our team who often don't get the recognition they deserve. The last thing I'll offer is if you haven't had a chance to look at the communique in the last couple of weeks, there are a lot of awesome pictures and articles and I just want to lift up to you all that we have so many wonderful examples of high school students who are working with and mentoring middle school and elementary kids, which is really special. We're seeing more of that than we ever have, and I think those are important points of connection across the district. We continue to have many shining examples of students who are leaders at the local, state, and national level with clubs and organizations. We have student athletes and musicians and artists just winning, winning, winning all over the place. And in addition to winning, having really great opportunities to engage in those kind of pursuits, which I think help you grow as a person. We have staff and students who are being really intentional about celebrating one another, particularly our Lunar New Year celebrations, and February is Black History Month, and we have a lot of great activities that have been highlighted in the communique as well. And then, you know, just to pair up with Brian's data presentation, we continue to have staff working so incredibly hard and intentionally to support academic learning, which is why we're here, and just have students who are really rising to those high expectations, and it's something for us to celebrate. It's a good time to be in the public schools. That's all I have. Thanks, Penny. I feel like we should give a shout out to Dow High JV because they earned first place in the JV Division Two on my birthday. Oh. <laughs> and they brought home state championship. Well, there we go. Congratulations. Happy yeah. I will accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> support. <laughs> you okay? Motion by Hatfield. <laughs> support by <laughs> Blazy. All in favor say aye. 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 Stand adjourned. <laughs>